true of too many believers. They sing it, but they don't mean it. They'd rather gain the world and all that the world has than to concentrate on things. I, Bill says that it wasn't his. It didn't originate with him, but he doesn't know where he found it, so we can't give any other credit to it. He, he, remember to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. It sounds redundant, but it's true. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Very, very hard to do for the average person because they do not have a value system that is worth anything. Continuing where we lost off in our study of the doctrine of fragmentation. Remember, we pointed out that at the uh, uh, fragmentation simply means to, to break into or fall to pieces. And that's the idea. We're talking about man's soul and the soul falling apart, the soul fragmenting, the soul uh, destroying itself and others. We looked at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, as the key to uh, the understanding of uh, what happens in soul of the person who goes negative toward the truth of God. Your soul falls apart. Uh, because even though you're born again, even though you're a child of God, you still retain the old sin nature within you. And as uh, such, the old sin nature has an area of strength which produces human good, an area of weakness which produces personal sins, the trends toward either loose living or toward uh, self-righteous arrogance, asceticism. Uh, and uh, it also has a lust pattern uh, in which it functions, the insatiable desire for, for uh, money, things, uh, success, lust, power, uh, all of these things, uh, the, the, the insatiable lust pattern, plus egocentricity for uh, we live entirely uh, for ourselves. We are egocentric in every sphere of our lives, this old sin nature. And so the point that we're working on now is uh, uh, Roman numeral three and the fact that every believer has a bomb in his soul. Now, the trigger mechanism for that bomb, the thing that sets the bomb off is mental attitude sin. Or you see, you when you're born again, uh, or and or you confess sin so that you no longer grieve or quench the Holy Spirit, you move into the divine sphere of power called the divine dynosphere. Living inside this divine sphere of power now, you are controlled or filled with the Holy Spirit, which gives you the omnipotence or the power to live. You are also guided and directed by the omnipotence of Bible doctrine, which gives you the omnipotence to live properly and in the right direction. And as you continue on positive volition toward, the do toward doctrine, continue filled with the Spirit, you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is your own palace. This is living the life that God wants you to live. This is living the life of blessing in spite of adversity, living the life of success, living the relaxed life, living the life beyond dreams. Uh, it's impossible for a person to understand what it's living, uh, what it's like to live the life beyond dreams, which simply says this, that inside your own palace of the divine dynasphere and you're working, fun functioning in the plan of God, this life is absolutely unbelievable. You couldn't dream about living this kind of a life. If you wanted to, you couldn't dream about it. It is so tremendous. It is so outstanding. It's so unusual. It's so great. It's so wonderful that you couldn't have ever dreamt that such a life was possible. It's a life beyond dreams. Now, why anybody would want to exit why anyone would want to leave is beyond comprehension, but it is possible because 
what happens is that whenever the believer uses his free will and volition to make a decision to allow a mental attitude sin to remain in his soul, then he exits the divine sphere of power and enters into the hot cosmic or the world or the system of darkness in which he lives in the sphere of darkness. He lives under the control and the direction of doctrine of demons. He is functioning under total subjectivity. Uh, he is moving uh, worse and worse uh, under scar tissue on his soul, a soul blackout, reversionism, apostasy, and total unhappiness so that regardless of what he finds, he will never ever find happiness, contentment, or satisfaction in this system. Besides that, uh, life goes on and he finds that he is, it is, he is incapable of handling life because uh, he does not have the divine operating assets for it. Now, uh, we're continuing with point D under this uh, a third uh, uh, point, and that says this, that the trigger mechanism, which I'll use TM, it doesn't stand for transcendental meditation, trigger mechanism, which is mental attitude sins, usually begin with one or another form of uh, arrogance. And uh, these things may be jealousy, uh, bitterness, hatred, vindictiveness, implacability, uh, self-pity, self-righteousness, self-centeredness. judging others, inordinate ambition, inordinate competition, whatever it may be, these, the, these areas enter into the life. Now, there's no sin to be tempted. Remember that. Everyone is tempted. Even our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted. But when it comes to the volition of your soul, you must decide whether you are going to admit that temptation as a sin in your life or whether you are going to reject it. That is something that you have to uh, dis determine in your own soul. Uh, we were eating at a restaurant the other day, and uh, when I went uh, to the salad bar, uh, a lady at a nearby booth came over and told Jan to tell me to quiet down because my voice was too loud, and it was disturbing her. Now, I had two choices when Jan told me, and that was to lower myself to her level and get louder uh, and or go over and set her straight or to treat her in grace uh, uh, and to ignore the thing, you know. I thought later on of a perfect answer. I thought, what, but it, I thought it took me four hours to think of it, but the perfect, the perfect answer would have been, Jan said, uh, would you speak up, please? I don't hear very well. And that would have been a perfect answer because like, the woman says, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you were hard of hearing. He's talking so you could hear better. But uh, anyway, uh, I just uh, realized, I mean, what I, here was a temptation, see? Uh, and I might have, uh, in the old days, I might have uh, started talking real loud and really make her unhappy and really rub the, the salt in the wound, you know, and then go over afterwards and say, was it okay? Could you hear all right? You know, and make a big deal out of it. But... I, I quickly weighed everything and decided that that was silly because if I admitted that mental attitude sin into my soul, then I was going to start the time bomb to function and I was going to fragment my own soul. And here was some idiot out here who was going to actually be able to, by that thing, enter into my soul and drive me out of fellowship. Who's the dummy? Who's the idiot? Not me. Of course not. It's her. No, it's me. I'm the stupid one. If I allow someone else and what they do or what they say to drive me out of fellowship, I'm the idiot, am I not? Of course. And so the best thing to do is forget about the deal. In fact, 
when I thought she left and left her purse, I was so kind as to go over and steal it. <laughs> no, uh, I saw her. I thought she left her purse, and I told the waitress about it so that she would catch the lady and give her her purse. So such a sweet person. Uh, and I, but uh, I could have said, uh, let's let her, I just let her sit there. Maybe I hope she hope someone steals it. <laughs> In fact, put it up on the seat. Maybe someone will. No, but those were all the things that could have happened, I thought later. But you see what I'm saying? How stupid for us to allow someone else uh, for of whom we are jealous. Uh, someone else uh, who may have injured us by gossip uh, to cause us to step out of fellowship. Uh, someone else that we, we're going to get even with. You know that the grizzly bear is the most vicious animal on four legs. More, the most vicious animal in all of the world is the western grizzly bear. And when the grizzly bear kills its prey, something, something that it's after, kills its, its uh, uh, food, there's only one animal that can walk up without any problem at all and eat off of that carcass. Not his, not his female companion. It's a skunk. The grizzly bear will allow the skunk to eat off of its carcass that it has killed. And it's the only animal because of the high price of getting even. He could drive the skunk away, but he knows the cost. It's involved in him with one spray. He's never. He doesn't have tomato juice to wash it off in. That's the only. I understand. That's the only way he can can get it washed off. That's why they use so much tomato juice. Nobody drinks it, but everybody would, uh, who's been squirted by it is skunk. Well, I drink it. But anyway, uh, you you see, we have a foolish set of standards sometimes, and we have the the attitude. Uh, you, you every day you read about, uh, or every week, or every so often you read about people who who got even with somebody by killing them. And now they're sitting in jail. Who got even with who as they're sitting in jail facing either uh, life in imprisonment or even uh, uh, the death penalty because they killed someone who did something bad to them? And now here they are with the rest of their life taking their freedom away. Who got even with who? But that's the same thing that happens inside the soul of the believer, even though it isn't as violent or vicious as that, Inside the soul of the believer, when you admit a mental attitude sin, you immediately set off the bomb, and the bomb begins its fragmentation to hit every portion of your soul and to, to destroy your soul in it, in piece by piece. And what, how it works is uh, found under point E, uh, and that is when the fragmentation of your soul begins... Fragmentation moves in accordance with the trends of your old sin nature. If the trend is toward asceticism, uh, toward self-righteousness, toward legalism, you will then move, start your fragmentation by uh, being, becoming critical, becoming judgmental, uh, by uh, committing uh, sins of the tongue, gossip, slander, maligning, all kinds of things like that are involved in sins of the tongue. And depending on your creativity, how you pass on those things will can be different. Uh, and you may you get involved in Christian degeneracy. And uh, uh, Christian degeneracy uh, leads, to, leads to Christian activism and you s fail to understand the function of the believer as an invisible hero in the world. If, on the other hand, the trend of your soul is toward uh, lasciviousness, you will become involved in lawlessness of one sort or another. You will become involved in rebellion, in throwing off the traces, in, uh, in uh, uh, reaction against authority. 
and the rejection of authority in, in every area of life. And uh, uh, this uh, w may eventually lead uh, through Christian, uh, through uh, immoral degeneracy uh, to uh, criminal functions uh, and uh, law-breaking uh, because you set yourself up as uh, the final word uh, uh, in, as far as law is concerned. Depending on the trend of your old sin nature, once you admit the, the fragmentation of the old, uh, of the sin, mental attitude sin, you begin to move in one of these two directions, depending on how your old sin nature is. And you can't look around you at some other people. Uh, I was listening this week uh, to some radio program where they said, you can, you can you learn a lot about yourself by studying your family tree, not necessarily where they were from, but what they were like. And it is true that you can look at your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather, look down the line of the, the male members of your family, and from that you can begin to learn something about your old sin nature. Uh, but because you are the accumulative result of all of the male uh, uh, old sin natures going all the way back to Adam, whether you're male or female, you, you, re you receive them from your father and your grandfather and uh, right down the line. So it's, it, it is helpful for you if you can know them is so that you can know the trend and the direction that your old sin nature could possibly take if the old sin nature fragments your soul so that you can look at yourself and you may say, uh, there is a problem. That's why so many fathers sometimes look at their sons uh, or their daughters uh, and they see in those sons or daughters the, the very same things that they recognized in themselves as uh, something that they perhaps were able to have control of by one means or another or semi-control and they see in their sons or daughters that they have no control and they are moving in a direction and that really scares some of, some of parents because they say, uh-oh, man, look at that. That's exactly uh, the direction uh, I took, uh, and how can I communicate to my child? And so they'll say, well, son or daughter, when I was your age, and then they, that what to pick, it immediately turns off the kid because the kid says, ah, eh, in arrogance, I'm different than you are. I have more power. I have more smarts. I have more ability. I'm greater than you are, so I don't have to worry about your trend. So they turn them off. And yet, really, what the parent is trying to say is, look, I went down that road, and I found out where it leads. But, you see, if a, if a son is smart, you learn one of two ways. Uh, there's only one. You either go to the College of Hard Knocks. The College of Hard Knocks is to learn from experience. That's the hard way. Or you learn the easy way, which is through precept and example. You, you look... And, and, and to study, and you say, uh-oh, boy, I don't want to go that direction. And there's many a person who has said, there, but for the grace of God, go I. By looking at some relatives in the family. My grandfather on the Irish side was a hard-drinking blacksmith back in the old days when blacksmiths would shoe horses. I almost became a blacksmith in a candy store. I used to shoe the flies. But, well, I just wanted to make sure you were awake on that one. But uh, uh, yeah, when in the, in the children, in the family, uh, as, as I look at those who were con uh, contemporaries, my aunts and uncles who are uh, on my mother's side, I could see one of my uncles died as an alcoholic. The old man could handle it, see? He died uh, at 93 after being a hard drinker all of his life. He had such a constitution. Uh, of course, his liver was like a rock when he, when he died, uh, but uh, he, well, he lived that long. But his son couldn't handle that. And his son, having the same trend, uh, died in his 40s, my uncle. And uh, he, was, he, he led a miserable life. He, he, he destroyed the lives of his uh, three children and his wife, and she finally had enough of it. She went another way, and they had nothing to do with him. In the end of his life, he died a broken, uh, uh, helpless, miserable uh, young man. Uh, tragically. I see, that's a trend. Uh, that, old, uh, uh, that old thing could be there. Uh, it could follow in the life. And there but for the grace of God, uh, go I. You learn, if you're smart, you learn the easy way. 
you, you uh, look into that and, and know the direction that your life could take if your life becomes fragmented. Now, some of us don't know anything about our family trees. Uh, many of us uh, uh, are ignorant of our family tree. Uh, uh, Jan uh, has an interesting family tree, uh, and uh, she has a father and an uncle. And she has a fantastic example of the way to go. Her father is an alcoholic, uh, even to this day. And he is uh, uh, now old. He, uh, he, he can't walk. He can't hardly get around by himself. He lives in one room by himself, miserable person. And she has an uncle who is fantastic. He got saved, born again, follows the Word of God. He's older than her father. He drives a, a camper from Arizona to here every up into Michigan every summer. He uh, he has a, a family that loves him, respects him. He he out in in, uh, in Arizona. He is, he still fixes cars uh, at uh, in his eighties for for people who old people around him who can't afford to have their car fixed. He still fixes cars. He's just uh, happy uh, and and excited about life. And we have such a fantastic time. When, his, when her uncle comes in, we have a glorious time. When we visit her dad, it's a, it's a very miserable experience. It's a tragic experience. We don't like to do We have to do it. We try to be a blessing. We can't. It, it, but the difference between the two. The trend came down to both men. Here was one whose life became fragmented. He went in that direction. Born again. He's born again. But, and, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Uncle Claude was the one who got him to come to a service uh, when he was, uh, or after he was saved. But you see what I'm saying? It's important to understand that the, the trend that you have. Now, that's, that, that's a trend over here. But most of us don't want to recognize the trend here toward asceticism or toward self-righteousness. And so we'll continue uh, to point out some of these things. The trend toward self-righteousness the trend toward legalism produces such tremendous heresies and false doctrines which are communicated by these people. Like uh, uh, the self-righteous, arrogant attitude that... Uh, uh, they look over here, you see, and they, as I said, her father is born again, though he's an alcoholic. Uh, and they'll say, well, he was never saved in the first place uh, because uh, uh, a believer can't commit those sins. Wrong. A believer can commit any sin that an unbeliever can commit and a few more that an unbeliever hasn't even heard of. When a believer is out of fellowship, he can do anything that an unbeliever can do and a few things that an unbeliever couldn't do. In addition, they come up with all kinds of things. Salvation by works. They come up by with spirituality by works. I'm spiritual because I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't gamble and I don't do this and I don't do that. That makes them spiritual. A lot of hogwash. That's not spirituality. I know a lot of people who don't smoke, who don't drink, who don't gamble, who don't go to movies, who don't do anything. And every one of them isn't spiritual. They're buried in the cemetery. Every one of them. They don't do any of those things. That has not been an issue. They look at this thing and they, where the Lord said, by their fruit you shall know them. And so they say, I don't judge anybody. I'm just a fruit examiner. Isn't that sweet? Spiritual garbage. Phonies. That's ridiculous. The self-righteous Christian concludes that unless you have a certain manifestation, you're not, you're not really saved. That's why we've had this fantastic emphasis today by MacArthur and his bunch 
on lordship salvation. If you don't accept Christ as Lord of your life, he's not the savior of your life. They're looking at the fruit of some believers who, who uh, are living over here in this uh, lascivious area. They never look at them over on this side, but see them over here on the lascivious area with their fragmented life. And they say, oh, they were never saved. Or look, if they, if they were really saved, you'd see the fruit in their lives. That's ridiculous. Now, the, the trend on this side, and let's put that in that, make that the next point. Point G, the trend on the other side is antinomianism. Now, that's a big word. Anti means against. Namas is the law. And so it really is lawlessness of one form or another. As a, as a child, it begins in disobedience to the parental uh, laws. But it also extends into a school. Now, I recognize that of all people, parents are far from perfect. And even more so, our teachers are far from perfect. But one of the worst things that parents can do is to try to get the school to change their rules in order to fit a child for the simple reason that you are teaching that child that when you're adult, if you don't like a certain law or a rule or something that's happening out there, you don't have to obey it. We'll get it changed for you. But that's not, that's not life, folks. I don't know where you live, but I know where I live. It's not life. You may not like a law, but you obey it or else. And in all of life, wherever there is authority, mark it down. Authority will not be fair all the time. Authority is not necessarily fair. And authority is not always right. But whether authority is fair and right is not the issue. If they are the legitimate authority, you are responsible to obey them. And so we have, we have a consistent, uh, begins with disobedience. And parents actually cater to the disobedience. No, you may not agree with what is set up as a child by your parents. You may not think it's fair. You may not agree with what the school sets up. And you may not think it's fair. And it may not be fair. But then whoever told you that life was going to be fair? There's only one place where there's fairness, and that's under the, the leadership, the rulership of God. God is always fair. But life is not fair. Life is not equitable. The framers of our Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal, and they meant before the law. All men are not created equal. And even before the law, we recognize the real, the, the underlying truth is that all men are not equal before the law. Tragically, because of human nature, the old sin nature. It's, it's one of those things. And so what do you do? You, do you withdraw from the human race because the human race isn't fair? Or do you learn how to live in a society that's unfair? Well, if you, if you are in the lawless side, you begin with disobedience to parents in your school. Uh, when our uh, son, uh, you, the, the, we, the coaches... Uh, I, re I recall one time when our oldest son was in high school at Leo and uh, he disobeyed one of the rules of the coach. Now, I didn't think the rule was very fair. I didn't think it was the right kind of a, uh, of a rule. However, I recognized that the coach had the position wherein he could make that rule and he had every right to enforce that rule. And I recall going into the coach's office and watching the coach take a stick and spank him as a teenager for disobeying that law, uh, that rule, though I told him before time and I told the coach that I didn't think it was the right rule, I didn't think it was a fair rule, but he broke the rule, he deserved the punishment. He deserved it. Because right or wrong, the authority sets the rule. And you can't go before uh, 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 and a police officer stops you and say, 
to the police officer, well, I don't think that the 55 mile an hour speed limit is fair. I don't think it's right. And it isn't. But just because it isn't fair or it isn't right, you don't have the right to disobey it, folks. And the government has every right to slap you with a ticket. And if you miss it three times, you have every right. They have every right to incarcerate you, take away your privilege of driving under, their, under the law. That's right. And what do you teach your children? If you don't like the law, you don't have to obey it. And I'll go to bat for you every time. Well, I won't. I won't do it. You break the law, you suffer the consequences. Now, too many parents have bailed their children out of consequences of disobedience only to find out that when they get to be adults, they have an attitude toward the uh, law that's the same way that I don't have to obey the laws I don't like or I disagree with. And they go down the line of degeneracy on the antinomian side. Lawlessness. Be beware of this, uh, this principle of lawlessness. It's arrogance on either side, see. Uh, uh, some of us uh, love to look over at the self-righteous, arrogant person over here, and we say, tch, 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 tch. they're arrogant and self-righteous. But there's just as much arrogance over here. This person makes the laws. Uh, this person breaks the law that he doesn't like because both of them become laws unto themselves. And nobody is a law unto himself. Nobody. And humility recognizes the principle that I am uh, under uh, the laws of, of, of establishment regardless of whether I like them or not. But you see, the trend toward lawlessness results in reaction against law. And here's what happens eventually. The reaction here, when it comes to a spiritual realm, these people react against Bible doctrine. They react against any authority of a pastor teacher. They can't, that, that grates on them until they find a pastor teacher like Timothy, who uh, is a, a Mr. Uh, milk Toast, and uh, they can uh, uh, push the pastor around, and that's where they go to church. And they don't care whether he teaches the truth or not. That's not the issue to them. They want someone who they can shove around. On this side, they become uh, the ones who tell the pastor what to do, and they look for the same kind of a pastor, uh, but from a different angle. These people want uh, kind of a pastor that's not going to tell them what what the Word of God says. This one has the ones who will tell the people what that the Word of God says, what they think are the norms and standards. And so they set them up. Thou shalt not, you know, the whole business. So they both have their own kind of a church. And so many churches are nothing more than compatible, fragmented souls which are gathered together and they sing the same songs and the same hymns and they have the same kind of an old sin nature. Uh, but it's really nothing more than a country club atmosphere of people who are supporting each other in their uh, degeneracy, whether moral or immoral degeneracy. Point uh, G then, uh, once the believer triggers the bomb, once you trigger the bomb through mental attitude sins, then you begin to move in the in your own soul you begin the destruction you begin self-destruction it will eventually result in the destruction of others but you have to destroy yourself first you destroy yourself first but while you're destroying yourself the tragedy is you destroy others this is where parental destruction is so bad a person who begins to destroy his own soul begins to set examples for his own family, uh, for his or her wife or husband, for the children in the home. And I think of multitudes uh, down the own who, because of their own self-destruction, have actually brought heartache and hardship on their own children. They have made it harder for their children to orient to life because they went negative toward the truth and allowed themselves to get into degeneration of one sort or another. But uh, they, uh, arrogance says, I really don't care about my family. Oh, they say I care about my family, but they don't. 
You see, that's a lot of, uh, of hogwash. And I often think what you are speaks so loud I can't hear what you say. If you're just banging your gums together for the most part and saying the pious platitudes that you think people want to hear about how much you love your family. But that's a lot of garbage. That's a lot of hogwash. Well, how much you love your wife, how much you love your husband, how much you love your children, how much you love your family is not in how much you talk, but what you, what you do in your life that demonstrates your, the priority that they have in your life. Trigger the mental attitude sins and you begin self-destruction in your own soul. And uh, it begins uh, in all situations with their, a reaction. You react against the truth. You react against Bible doctrine. You react against the pastor teacher. You react against the local church. You react against some people in the local church. Some people you don't like. Uh, years ago I had a couple of uh, two men who, who were partners in business and they, they had a problem and uh, they, they broke up and they, they couldn't go to the same church because they were partners and so uh, uh, they, one reacted against the other and left. I'm not sh sure who was right. I don't really care who was right. The issue is, if you want Bible doctrine, you stick it out. Because that's what counts. But reaction be is where you begin. And reaction is uh, a part of the mental attitude sins. And uh, uh, it's subjectivity and so forth. From there, you move into the frantic search for happiness. Now, the frantic search for happiness is uh, the, the condition in which you are seeking to find happiness in anything and everything except the true source of happiness. Beloved of God, there is only one source for happiness, and that is God. God has been happy from eternity past. There has never been a time when God was not happy. God, in, in his omniscience, knew every horrible, terrible thing which would ever be done to him or against him in all of time, and yet not one of those things has ever upset God. God is absolute happiness. And the only way that a person, in, a member of the human race, can ever be happy is if God shares his happiness with you. If God shares his happiness with you, you are happy regardless of circumstances. If God does not share his, his happiness with you, you uh, may have an occasional temporal happiness. Uh, that, that is, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll live like this. You'll, in fact, you'll live for these happinesses. Uh, okay, you'll live for the weekends when you, quote, unquote, are happy. You'll live for the weekends when you, quote, unquote, have fun. You'll live for the six-pack when you have fun. You'll live for the, uh, the party when you have fun. You'll live for these things, but they never produce lasting happiness. They used to have a cigarette advertisement for one of the businesses they satisfy. Obviously, if they satisfy, you'd never want a second one, right? They don't satisfy. They make you crave for more. It doesn't satisfy. But happiness is in that situation. And so uh, you, you begin by destroying yourself, and uh, you start with the, the reaction factor, reaction factor, then you move for frantic search for happiness, then uh, you move to emotional revolt of the soul. Now, what does that mean? Emotional revolt of the soul is when the take over the soul instead of the mentality. 